Hi, I'm Rashonda Kate. This is Reading with Rashonda. We're reading Clotel by William Wells Brown, and we are on chapter 24, The Arrest. The fearful storm it threatens lowering, which God in mercy long delays. Slaves yet may see their masters cowering, while whole plantations smoke and blaze. By Carter. It was late in the evening when the coach arrived at Richmond, and Clotel once more alighted in her native city. She had intended to seek lodgings somewhere in the outskirts of town, but the lateness of the hour compelled her to stop at one of the principal hotels for the night. She had scarcely entered the inn when she recognized among the numerous black servants one to whom she was well known. And remember, this is a problem because she is dressed up as white man. And if she really looked like a white man, she wouldn't be worried about it. But since we know she didn't at all look like a white man, this is cause for fear. So, um... And her only hope was that her disguise would keep her from being discovered. The imperturbable calm and entire forgetfulness of self which induced Clotel to visit a place from which she could scarcely hope to escape, to attempt the rescue of a beloved child, demonstrate that overwillingness of woman to carry out the promptings of the finer feelings of her heart. True to woman's nature, she had risked her own liberty for another. She remained in the hotel during the night, and the next morning, under plea of illness, she took her breakfast alone. That day, the fugitive slave paid a visit to the suburbs of the town and once more beheld the cottage in which she had spent so many happy hours. It was winter, and the clematis and passion flower were not there, but there were the same walks she had so often pressed with her feet, and the same trees which had so often shaded her as she passed through the garden at the back of the house. Old remembrances rushed upon her memory and caused her to shed tears freely. Clotel was now in her native town and near her daughter, but how could she communicate with her? How could she see her? To have made herself known would have been a suicidal act. Betrayal would have followed, and she arrested. Three days had passed, and Clotel still remained in the hotel at which she had first put up, and yet she had got no tidings of her child. Unfortunately for Clotel, a disturbance had just broken out amongst the slave population in the state of Virginia, and all strangers were eyed with suspicion. The evils consequent on slavery are not lessened by the incoming of one or two rays of light. If the slave only becomes aware of his condition and conscious of the injustice under which he suffers, if he obtains but a faint idea of these things, he will seize the first opportunity to possess himself of what he conceives to belong to him. The infusion of the Anglo-Saxon with African blood has created an, an insurrectionary feeling among the slaves of America hitherto unknown. I am offended by that. The infusion of Anglo-Saxon with African blood has created an insurrectionary feeling among the slaves of America hitherto unknown. So I, we should keep reading, um, but it sounds like having white blood coursing through their veins is helping the slaves rise up. They wouldn't have done that if they didn't have white blood in them. Anyway, let's keep going. Aware of their blood connection with their owners, these mulattoes labor under the sense of their personal and social injuries and tolerate, if they do not encourage in themselves, low and vindictive passions. On the other hand, the slave owners are aware of their critical position and are ever watchful, always fearing an outbreak among the slaves. Okay, so it's more, it didn't give them power, but discontent. Oh, really? We're related, you and I. <clears throat> okay. True, the free states are equally bound with the slave states to suppress any insurrectionary movement that may take place among the slaves. The northern freemen are bound by their constitutional obligations to aid the slaveholder in keeping his slaves in their chains. Yet there are, at the time we write, four millions of bond slaves in the United States. The insurrection to which we now refer was headed by a full-blooded Negro who had been born and brought up a slave. He had heard the twang of the driver's whip and saw the warm blood streaming from the Negro's body. He had witnessed the separation of parents and children and was made aware, by too many proofs, that the slave could expect no justice at the hand of the slave owner. He went by the name of Nat Turner. He was a preacher amongst the Negroes and distinguished for his eloquence, respected by the whites, and loved and venerated by the Negroes. On the, on the discovery of the plan for the outbreak, Turner fled to the swamps, followed by those who had joined in the insurrection. 
Here they revolted, here the revolted Negroes numbered some hundreds and for a time bade defiance to their oppressors. The dismal swamps cover many thousands of acres of wild land and a dense forest with wild animals and insects, such as are unknown in any part of Virginia. Here one, runaway Negroes usually seek a hiding place, and some have been known to reside here for years. The revolters were joined by one of these. He was a large, tall, full-blooded Negro with a stern and savage countenance. The marks on his face showed that he was from one of the barbarous tribes in Africa, and claimed that country as his native land. His only covering was a girdle around his loins, made of the skins of wild beasts which he had killed. His only token of authority among those that he led was a pair of epaulets made from the tail of a fox and tied to his shoulder by a cord. That is quite the figure he's striking. And remember now, we're in the dismal swamps where there was an outbreak of yellow fever. People were dying gruesomely left and right. All right. Brought from the coast of Africa when only 15 years of age to the island of Cuba, he was smuggled from thence into Virginia. He had been two years in the swamps and considered it his future home. He had met a Negro woman who was also a runaway, and, after the fashion of his native land, had gone through the process of oiling her as the marriage ceremony. That's interesting. I will need to learn more about that. They had built a cave on a rising mound in the swamp. This was their home. His name was Pequilo. His only weapon was a sword made from the blade of a Sith, which he had stolen from a neighboring plantation. His dress, his character, his manners, his mode of fighting were all in keeping with the early training he had received in the land of his birth. He moved about with the activity of a cat, and neither the thickness of trees nor the depth of water could stop him. He was a bold, turbulent spirit, and from revenge imbued his hands in the blood of all the whites he could meet. Well, that's extreme also, right? Like, okay, we don't need a massacre. Jesus doesn't want, Jesus doesn't want that. Hunger, I'm not saying I don't understand, just saying it's not right. Hunger, thirst, fatigue, and loss of sleep, he seemed, to made, he seemed made to endure as if by peculiarity of constitution. His air was fierce, his step oblique, his look sanguinary. Such was the character of one of the leaders in the Southampton insurrection. All Negroes were arrested who were found beyond their master's threshold, and all strange whites watched with great degree of alacrity. Such was the position in which Clotel found affairs when she returned to Virginia in search of her Mary. Had not the slave owners been watchful of strangers owing to the outbreak, the fugitive could not have escaped the vigilance of the police, for advertisements announcing her escape and offering a large reward for her arrest had been received in the city previous to her arrival, and the officers were therefore on the lookout for their runaway slave. Ah, but if they were on the lookout for a runaway slave, they weren't on the lookout for what Clotel seemingly looked like, which was a white man, which was inherently free. It was on the third day, as the quadroon was seated in her room at the inn, still in the disguise of a gentleman, that two of the city officers entered the room and informed her that they were authorized to examine all strangers. I wonder what type of examinations were authorized. Um, and informed her that they were authorized to examine all strangers to assure the authorities that they were not in league with the revolted Negroes. With trembling heart, the fugitive handed the key of her trunk to the officers. To their surprise, they found nothing but woman's apparel in the box, which raised their curiosity and caused a further investigation that resulted in the arrest of Clotel as a fugitive slave. Now, why did she only have women's apparel? The only man's apparel she had is what she had on? I've got questions. She was immediately conveyed to prison, there to await the orders of her master. For many days, uncheered by the voice of kindness, alone, hopeless, desolate, she waited for the time to arrive when the chains were to be placed on her limbs, and she returned to her inhuman and unfeeling owner. Mm. Mm. The arrest of the fugitive was announced in all the newspapers, but created little or no sensation. The inhabitants were too much engaged in putting down the revolt among the slaves, and although all the odds were against the insurgents, the, white found, the whites found it no easy matter with all their caution. Every day brought news of fresh outbreaks. Without scruple and without pity, the whites massacred all blacks found beyond their owner's plantations. Again, 
We don't need massacres. The Negroes in return set fire to houses and put those to death who attempted to escape from the flames. Thus carnage was added to carnage and the blood of whites flowed to avenge the blood of the blacks. These were the ravages of slavery. No graves were dug for the Negroes. Their dead bodies became food for dogs and vultures and their bones partly calcined by the sun remained scattered about as if to mark the mournful fury of servitude and lust of power. When the slaves were subdued, except a few in the swamps, bloodhounds were put in this dismal place to hunt out the remaining revolters. Among the captured Negroes was one of whom we shall hereafter make mention. Mm. So bloody. All right, so that was chapter 24 of Clotel by William Wells Brown. We'll stop there for today. Until next time, I'm Rashonda Cade, and this is Reading with Rashonda.